First of all, thank you to the moderators for having me here. Uh, they don't call me the trash man for nothing. I'm always bringing up the end at University of Washington, so. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. So uh, we've heard some wonderful talks from some experts on component separation techniques, both anterior and posterior. Uh, I just put this slide up here for some language that I'm gonna use during this talk. Uh, I am not gonna spend a lot of time discussing techniques because we have heard from people much more talented than I am already about this. But let's talk about the different complications that can occur after your component separations. I kind of like to break them down into two different categories. First category is we're gonna do our acute in-hospital complications. Uh, this is a study from Carolinas. They looked at 775 patients uh, and they found that of anybody getting a component separation, their incidence of any complication was 27%. So one in four of their patients are gonna get some type of complication. And the majority of these are wound complications being 35% or so of these patients. <clears throat> you can see listed the various types uh, their readmission rates, their acute kidney injury, their intra-abdominal abscesses. These are all standard, usual post-operative complications that occur, uh, but it's good to have some numbers to be able to discuss with your patients what to expect after they're gonna be getting these complex hernia repairs. Most of these patients are gonna have had prior surgery, are gonna be used to complications, having this conversation is gonna be a little bit easier, but trying to understand what is gonna be the things that are gonna get you back into the operating room What's gonna be something you can manage without a further operation is very important. Uh, I like to specifically mention uh, seroma formation and superficial wound breakdown as well as cellulitis. The wound complications are kind of one of the drivers that have led more people to adopt the posterior component separation as opposed to an anterior approach. More long-term complications that are gonna come up down the line. These are the results from their uh, hernia recurrence, infection, and overall mortality. As you can see over this time frame, they had low mortality, relatively low hernia recurrence in general with their component separations despite the fact of relatively high numbers of in-hospital and acute complications. Uh, I'd like to specifically mention the importance of enterotomy, enterotomy being the leading factor for infection and recurrence. Uh, even with low enterotomy rates, it can drive up your recurrence rates. So taking your time when you're doing, if you're doing a posterior component separation, making sure you're licensing every adhesion. If you're gonna be doing an ETEP, I think it's a great suggestion to do that intra-abdominal peak uh, because if you're gonna be sewing a lot of holes in your posterior layer closed and you can't see what's on the other side, uh, you're certainly at risk for enterotomies and bowel injury otherwise. Other factors of leading importance for this patient population are going to be the patients with a higher BMI, uh, 35 to 40 or above, uh, class two, uh, excuse me, three and four um, uh, infection rates, use of anterior component separation, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes, and the use of an absorbable type of mesh, whether that's biosynthetic or pure biologic mesh. So separating out uh, the wound complications into anterior and posterior component separation complications, uh, you can see that the percent, the, I gave numbers and percentages here so that you could see that uh, twice as many patients were in this posterior component separation group, uh, and the percentage of issues was similar in the two groups, but of important note, the actual statistical significance uh, really was in the cellulitis and the wound infection group um, in the anterior component separation versus the posterior component separation. So in the study, statistical significant wound infections and cellulitis occurred in the anterior group. Uh, these numbers were not statistically significant in the posterior component separation group. So, you know, a lot has been talked about creation of skin flaps, uh, and one of the things we worry about with creation of skin flaps is uh, uh, blood supply. In the, one of the first talks in this room, uh, we heard a wonderful plastic surgeon talking about the importance of preservation of blood supply when you're making your anterior flaps, because no one wants to have this happen where you're literally watching skin die day by day on the floor, watching your mesh get exposed, watching the patient get sicker in front of you. Skin complications, dehiscence, infection can occur at rates up to 40%, with some papers even quoting a 36 to 63% rate of skin damage, skin issues in the anterior component separation patients. 
There are better techniques now, preservation of perforators, trying to be mindful of where the blood supply is coming from and try to minimize your, your uh, going through the wrong planes, the wrong tissues, which will lead to damage to the blood supply, the neurovascular bundle, uh, all things that are going to increase your wound complication rate. So no one wants to see these wound complications. You can see the progression from picture A to picture B over the course of about four days for this patient. It can be relatively rapid and it can be somewhat difficult to decide which patients are gonna fail this and which you're gonna be able to just continue to manage non-operatively. These are just some more pictures with varying degrees of uh, heinousness, for lack of a better word. Uh, you can see uh, the pictures on the left is usually the uh, preoperative picture. Picture on the right is usually the end result. So even with these complications, infections, problems, people can have liberal lives, but you can tell, especially with the top gentleman, he could live his life, but he was not a particularly happy person with that big hole in his abdominal wall. Uh, so this has been mentioned before. This is not going to be news to anybody in this room. Hopefully, posterior component separation has significantly reduced overall wound complications compared to anterior. Uh, but as has been discussed, if you have to manage skin, you have to manage skin issues, you're going to still run into issues with skin at some point with your posterior repairs. This benefit for the posterior repair can be outweighed by the need for greater release of the midline to get your tension-free closure in the midline. So decide, the decision-making process of whether to do your anterior and posterior uh, is important. Uh, and you have to know that even though most people are preferring to do a posterior component separation approach, that does not necessarily mean that the anterior should be completely abandoned. And it has its role in the armamentarium, as everyone has discussed. Uh, talking about recurrence rate, hernia recurrence rate after anterior component separation, this study was 16 to 27 um, percent. They found in this uh, study, they also found that uh, eight patients with hernia recurrence versus two in the posterior component separation group. So overall, your hernia recurrence in the current literature that I have been able to review shows that there is a slight reduction in your recurrence rate doing a posterior component separation compared to an anterior component separation. Uh, I think as these uh, techniques are used over the next 10 years, we're going to get better, more robust data about this to get much more accurate numbers about this. Posterior component separation specific complications. So when I think of anterior component separations, my mind goes to wound complications. When I go to posterior component separation, I start thinking about lo more long-term recurrence or the dreaded posterior sheath disruption. This is one of my patients. It's a little hard to see, but you can see that there is a line where there is bowel above and bowel below. This is, uh, you never want to see this when you're looking at your post-op day five uh, hernia repair, where you just have a complete breakdown of your posterior component leading to a bowel obstruction. I use uncoated mesh in, this patient, in these patients, so that bowel, as soon as it sits, gets into that space, sticks to your mesh, uh, you're going to have a, a uh, bowel obstruction, and hopefully you're going to discover it sooner rather than later and take care of it early. Uh, I have taken care of people who have had chronic posterior disruptions, and those are not fun cases to do. So if you uh, can find this early, I recommend repairing this and doing this surgery early, as opposed to waiting for things to get better over time, because the scarring of the bowel to your likely uncoated mesh is just going to make your next surgery much harder. Uh, this is a nice little picture here. This is from uh, uh, Paula and Rosen, uh, one of their fabulous papers on component separation. Uh, I feel that uh, poor preparation, poor understanding of the anatomical layers uh, can lead to significant disastrous complications. Whether this is injury to the semilunar line or whether this is in, uh, actually injury to the neurovascular bundle, both have issues, both cause problems. And when this, so this picture has been shown, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but this is what can happen when you see these things that have been done before you get there. Usually you're going to see denervation of the muscle, so you're not going to see any more muscle belly. Uh, I have a colleague who likes to call it the ghost of the transversus abdominis and the ghost of the internal oblique, because if you squint hard enough, you can see a very, very thin layer of what may have been the internal oblique at one point. But at this point, there's been so much damage to the neurovascular bundle, to the semilunar, semilunar line, that your anatomy is basically completely eliminated, and now your options for repair are greatly reduced. As people who have taken care of this problem after they've had this neurovascular injury, after they have an injury to the semilunar line, trying to fix this is a nightmare and often less than satisfactory. 
Some other considerations, pulmonary complications. We, a lot of people are going to worry about increasing intra-abdominal pressure, increasing intra, causing almost intra-abdominal hypertension. We're also taking care of patients who have higher than average baseline intra-abdominal pressures because they're obese. Obese people are going to have a higher pressure at baseline, so then when you repair them, you are further limiting their intra-abdominal space, and that's going to further increase the intra-abdominal pressure. 20% of patients undergoing either anterior or posterior component separations will have have some pulmonary complications with uh, respiratory failure requiring ventilation as a four time higher length of stay and 18 times higher mortality rate. So if you were discovering these complications, you're cl either you didn't release enough muscle and you had too much tension on your closure, uh, but this is something you need to pay attention to and worry about in your patients who are getting these complex repairs, keeping an eye on their pulmonary complications and doing early intervention to improve it. Gastrointestinal complications, ileus being the most common. If your ileus is, is prolonged more than three to four days, that's usually my trigger to get a CAT scan to look for that posterior sheath disruption because I think it's easy for us to bury our head in our sands and say, I did a lot of lysis adhesions in this person, their bowel is going to be slow to wake up. But it's better to know that this is, there's a posterior sheath problem early because it is much easier to fix when the bowel is not stuck to that mesh. Some risk factors for post op complications, and what can we do to minimize this? Uh, optimization of prehabilitation. We learned when we can't do that, but when possible, try to do this. If someone's coming in with COPD, they are more likely to have pulmonary complications afterwards. Getting your pulmonary medicine colleagues involved, sending those patients to the ICU early, leaving them intubated for a day or two to let some wound healing occur while you can have muscle paralysis before moving on can improve your postoperative complication rates. Mortality is not usually the issue here, but complications have significant costs to not only the patient but the healthcare system and significant quality of life factors. When we look at this total, this study, this very nice study by Ferguson and colleagues, almost four, over 4,000 patients undergoing posterior, or excuse me, component separation. Again, a high complication rate, 25% of patients getting a complication rate, and these are the factors that lead to the most problems, COPD, obesity, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. These are some modifiable patient factors where you can improve someone's diabetic control. You can get them on cardiopulmonary rehab to improve their pulmonary status. Uh, you can get them optimized for surgery if possible, and these are the patients, these are the problems to look at that you should intervene on pre-surgery to have a better post operative outcome. Feel free at any time to send me any questions. Uh, I put my email and my uh, Twitter handle, which I did before I became a doctor, so it's not a nice doctor name, but um, if anybody has any questions anytime, feel free to correspond with me. Always happy to talk. Thank you very much.